the initial predictions were based off of some data from China. And Chinese data is very, very risky to depend on because the government influences whatever data is allowed out. What's up, guys? This is Will Will with PragerU. We've been hearing so much about the coronavirus pandemic. What should we do? I'll go back to work, stay at home for months longer. So I'm going to talk to an expert here in Los Angeles, Dr. Reed Wilson, about what he thinks we should do. Let's go do it. My name is Reed Wilson. I practice cardiology and internal medicine in Los Angeles, California. And so you've been dealing with coronavirus patients here. How many coronavirus patients have you seen roughly yourself? Probably just on the order of 10 to 15 ones that I'm acutely treating that I have a diagnosis. How is the coronavirus different than the flu? We see a lot of people comparing, oh, well, the flu deaths every year are way more than the coronavirus deaths that we've seen in the States right now. How is it that the coronavirus is actually worse than the seasonal flu? Coronavirus is a novel virus. This is not a book novel. It means a new virus. When you see influenza each season, your body has already seen the virus. It has some immunity to it, maybe not perfect, maybe you'll get a little sick, but enough so that it protects you. It's not a novel virus, it comes around every year. Secondly, with the influenza virus, we have a vaccine. So for better, for worse, sometimes it works better some years, sometimes it work, works worse. You will have also some immunity. So that's already two layers to protect you from getting the flu. Finally, if you should break through that and still get the flu, we have medications that treat the exact influenza virus. The most common ones people might remember are Tamiflu or Zofluza. And so we have like a three-pronged attack to attack influenza virus. With the coronavirus, we have no natural immunity. Remember, before five months ago, this particular coronavirus has never been seen. We do have coronaviruses in that classification that have traveled around the United States and we've developed some immunity from so that they cause sort of similar symptoms to a common cold. We, on the second step of that uh, variety, we have, uh, no vaccination to date, which will protect you. So we have no natural immunity, we have no vaccination, and then if you should get the disease, whereas influenza, we have something to treat you, right now we're doing avid research to find out what drugs will treat this disease. But so far, we're almost zero for three. In California, we have or at least in Los Angeles, we have about 10 million people, and we've had only a few hundred deaths. You know, not to downplay those deaths, but it's not very many when you have 10 million people in this city. Why have we not seen more people dying than, than the numbers projected? I think that's a two-pronged question, and I can deal with California alone first. But let's do that second. How about first, let's talk about predictions. The initial predictions were based off of some data from China. Chinese data is very, very risky to depend on because the government influences whatever data is allowed out. So you're not getting a true sense. You can make some estimations, but China is not like the United States. So if I recall correctly, the initial uh, projection was that 2.2 million Americans might die of this disease. It seems that every week that goes by, this number is getting lower and lower and lower. We saw initial projections of a three to 4% mortality rate. They just did a study in Germany where uh, they projected the infection mortality rate at about 0.4%. I've seen some other literature showing it might go as low as 0.1, but that's not published yet. So let's stick with just the published literature. So every time we've revised it, it's gone down. So our initial estimates we're very far off, and if you put garbage data into a scenario, you're going to have garbage data come out the scenario. So that's going to be very important. As far as California, why, let's say, we're different than New York is what I perceive your question is. We have uh, several different features. It is projected that there were initially about eight individuals who were the initial individuals coming into California and spreading the disease. Uh, in New York, by the way, in California, we got it from Asia and we got the type A type, which is the kind start. That's the initial type. 
in New York, they had about a hundred initial people coming in and f spreading their tentacles from Europe. And that's a di slightly different brand of coronavirus. It's the same, everything's the same. It's maybe a little molecule different there. It's a type C. And in addition in New York, they had a super spreader. When super spreaders are, we, we have no idea why this happens. One person, instead of spreading it to five or six people, he spread it to a hundred people. Now, add on top of that, the fact that the initial spreaders came into both locations about a month before we put restrictions down. So it was in the subways, it's in the elevators, it's in the high rise office buildings where everybody's cramped on top of each other and you have the perfect soup for a New York catastrophe. We're more of a freeway society, we're spread out, we had less infiltration, we're much better off. Do you think the social distancing and quarantining, self-quarantining played a big role in, in stopping the spread of this, at least in California? We won't know until after this is over, for sure. People can have as many hypotheses as they want, but we have uh, countries around the world, some of them are doing more intensive social spreading than others. And this is gonna be something that we won't know. When you think that there's going to be 2.2 million deaths, you're gonna take much more aggressive measures than if you think there's going to be 50,000 deaths. Remember in some flu seasons, we had 80,000 deaths. So, and no one panicked. So we'll know a little bit, but you have to realize initial projections caused harsher uh, methods to be instituted. Whether they're right or wrong, we won't know yet. Whether they have, how they have to continue, this is something we can discuss. We saw Sweden practicing less social distancing, less of the self-quarantining. Uh, if you're familiar with that, how, have, how has that model panned out for them? Has it been successful? It, they're seeing a, an increase in cases now. Uh, they're sort of similar to Finland, from what I have been reading, and uh, they have not destroyed their economy. I don't know what would have happened here. It's a different milieu. And right now, we are at the peak of the crisis. New York was decimated with uh, ventilator cases. So again, it's easier to look back in retrospect and finger point, but you have to do what the data shows you at the moment. I happen to think that we totally overreacted initially because of this, but it's understandable why we did. In fact, if you want to go into historical averages, there's a Spanish flu of 1918. Um, I don't know if you're mm -hmm, familiar. Yeah. It uh, killed about maybe 600,000 Americans, which is on a much smaller population than we had at the time. It killed more people around the world than World War I did, which had just come to a completion. And we're all horrified by World War I numbers. Cities that uh, did a quarantining and uh, this distancing did much better. So from a historical viewpoint, and just as a throw out comment, we talk about quarantine, this comes from the Italians, and you would have to quarantine for 40 days. And that was uh, quaran quarantine, that's the uh, origin of the word quarantine. So speaking of Italy, we've seen it be a, a horrible, horrible circumstances there. What happened there? What made it so bad in that country? It's a multiple of effects. They have an intimate relation of trade with China and they had the Chinese coming in from the Wuhan area all over, uh, all over the place. So their initial introduction was rather rapid. Secondly, I believe it has the oldest population in Europe. So all of a sudden, as we all have come to discover, age is a marked risk factor. And with age, you get other diseases. You commonly have hypertension and diabetics. Italy, if you've been there, is a smoking country. They like to smoke and they're gonna have lung damage and be more susceptible. Finally, of the European Union, Italy's healthcare system is, is one of the worst. So if, if you add in the fact of your age of your population, the inundation of the virus with a uh, high uh, risk factor, you're going to have a giant problem. In terms of some actual good news, when we spoke on the phone yesterday, you were talking about how California has peaked. We're hoping it has. 
Okay, we've never seen, when I've looked at our local hospitals, it's really plateaued. There's not been this, remember we were told they were gonna have this market acceleration right. headed upward. It's really been very flat. And this is good news. I myself have seen many, uh, I haven't seen a uh, COVID case probably for five or six days that I can actually diagnose. Uh, with it with any assurity, which is very different than I did a few weeks ago mm -hmm. um, We are just not seeing as much and I think part of it is we were set up with the expectation and the fear that we're all gonna die and We're not and we're gonna survive this and there's some very good news coming out for example our testing, we have a new saliva test uh, that just got approved yesterday. And the great news about saliva tests is they don't have to take this swab and ram it to the back of your throat, exposing healthcare workers who each time have to change their gloves, change their mask, change their gown, which were short on protective equipment. Instead, you can, let's say, be in your car and spit several times into a cup and off it goes. And so you don't need to use up the protective equipment and the uh, healthcare worker of which tens of thousands have gotten disease from the patients, uh, they don't have to be exposed. The, uh, another good thing is we're trying to, starting to see some drug trials coming in. So remdesivir, which is an antiviral agent, uh, they just published in the New England Journal on Friday. Cedars was part of the uh, multi-center trial. It, they put people into two groups. They tried to do a control group, which didn't get the drug, and an actual group, which did. And it showed benefit in two-thirds of the cases. So it's a small study. You know, with only 60 people, it's going to be small. But that's quite a benefit. Uh, we're starting to understand what's going on with the lungs. We're starting to understand this thing called a cytokine storm and how we can help protect it. And we have our, we're experimenting now with new blockers of the uh, yeah, of this cytokine storm, and they seem to be working. It's really good news. The thing is, things are happening so fast you wouldn't even believe it. I think we talked about the fact that 63 days after they sequenced the gene, remember this is a new gene, 63 days after they sequenced the gene, they had the first vaccine injected into a human to try. This is unbelievable. It usually takes five to 15 years to develop a vaccine. We're talking about 63 days. It's a, it's a truly remarkable feat. We have interactions around the world, uh, particularly with those countries we can trust data. Uh, the French, the Italians, the English, Canadians, Israelis. We, this, we are having a massive communication of data. And I think there's maybe 70 people or groups trying to develop a vaccine even as we speak. And that's gonna be the big difference maker when we can finally get a vaccine. There's so much that goes into that that I wanna break down with the things that you are just sure. talking about. Why don't you hear any of that good news in the mainstream media? When I go onto my phone, it's all just everyone's dying and, and things are horrible. Why don't you think that we hear about any of these success stories? Because obviously they're there, and I'm, I'm sure you're not the only doctor here in Los Angeles, or at least around America, who's hearing these things and reading about this. Why don't we hear about it? Part of it's a news cycle. If, if John graduates from high school, you don't hear about it. But if John got murdered, you'd hear about it. So we're a uh, society that, that sort of tends to f focus in on bad news. Secondly, it's become so political that there's people arguing on both sides. And the next great argument, and we can talk about this, the next great argument is when to open things up. So, the, so everybody's got their time and they want to get the eyeballs. And the things that grab eyeballs is conflict, and anger, and sadness. And uh, this is what we see on the news. This is not what's happening. This should be a story written about the greatness of our society. It is truly a moment in time when we should all look back and say, look how far we've come. I think one of the most amazing things that we can look at in terms of that is that you were talking about these 63 days um, developing this vaccine, as you said. That's because of the free market, really. This isn't a, a socialized medicine no. success story. This is because of the free market, wouldn't you say? I would say and it's going to be very important, particularly an academic center can do a genome a research and sequence it out. But how do you mass produce for millions of people 
with just an academic center or a government. I think you'll see when the government tries to be a benefit, and they are trying, but it's so bureaucratic. You try just look at all the loans that were promised, we're still going to be waiting. But that's just money. This is lives if we can help with the vaccine. The two largest private companies, I believe it's Sanofi and uh, GlaxoSmithKline, are the two largest uh, vaccine makers. They've decided, private, to combine their forces so that they can make a vaccine quicker and better than ever it's ever been done before. This is even competitors, direct competitors, coming together because they have the private technical know-how to ramp this up so that we can treat millions of people, because that's what it's going to take to break this, to have millions of people vaccinated. It's, it's a beautiful combination of government, universities, but most importantly, the private system that is going to enable us to do this. It's, you have researchers from private companies and universities Rutgers is the one that developed the saliva test, I believe. And uh, they, par they have to partner with private enterprise so that it can get out and get to you. So this is a true partnership in everybody. Science, medicine, distributors, truck drivers, everybody has to be involved in this to get this to you. The makers of, your, of the needles, the makers of the, va of the syringes, the makers of the bottles. This is all America and everybody working together. This is how it should be. This is, again, a positive, a great positive. It's, it's maybe something we won't see again in our lifetime. And speaking again about the tests, um, with the American innovation and the free market really making these great tests and, and the vaccines and innovating, but we saw uh, all these tests from China come in after we're now starting to discover that it was created in a lab in Wuhan, and now they're trying to you know, act like a savior, sending us all these tests. What do you think about that situation? Uh, it's, it's upsetting on one hand, and um, unbelievable on another hand. On the one hand, even if it didn't come from a lab, and it just came from the marketplace, and I, we won't know until we do the full investigation. They sat on this disease for a very long time. It also appears that the organization we depend on for co world coordination or the World Health Organization also sat on this. And you can. this is represented by Dr. Fauci, who back in January 21st said this is not going to be a problem. Now, he wasn't lying. He was using the data that they provided him. So in that sense, it's understandable because it's a totalitarian society. But we, the rest of the world, who has freely communicates with open word, were penalized. And we're penalized further because of the trillions of dollars this has done into many, many economies, not just the American economy. Secondly, it's doubly hurting us because much of their uh, saving is actually harming. Great Britain had to return all of their antibody testing because it was found to be inadequate. Uh, daily, I see Chinese product entering into America and patients asking me about to interpret their antibody tests. How do I interpret an antibody test where I have no idea what f yes or no means, what positive or negative means in relation to the disease? It's just not right. So we're being hit from the side on the left and being hit from the side on the right. And China is trying to come in as a savior and it's the, it's the free societies of the world which will eventually save the world. I love that. I think that's a great thing. In terms of going back to where you were talking about peaking in California, mm -hmm. or at least here in Los Angeles that our cases are starting to peak, does that mean that, that we should be getting back to work fairly soon, having people end their social distancing and the self-quarantine and getting back to work. Because again, I go on social media and I see a lot of people who I trust on a lot of other issues and they say that this is all a conspiracy theory and we all need to get back to work. And then still the other camp of people, hysteric, saying we shouldn't be working for another two months. What, what is your take on that about actually getting people back into the workforce to save this economy? I think it's more than even just saving the economy, if I can extrapolate. Yeah. It's estimated that 79% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. 
We've been out of work for four weeks. You can use your credit cards so much. What is that doing to the financial health, psych, uh, psychic health, and even the physical health of our nation? You can't run a country and survive on no work. You can't live in a cocoon. America used to be very aware of death. Before we had vaccines and antibiotics, death was a chronic companion. People died all the time. People had 10 children because only two would survive. We live in this society that says death is not allowed. And that is not a reasonable expectation. We're going to have some diseases. People are going to die in car crashes. People are going to have cancer. And we're going to have to just accept that there's going to have to be mortality. We can't protect everybody. If you ever gave me a choice between freedom and mortality, I'll take freedom any day. So we're going to have to learn our freedoms are hard fought and won. Let's not give them up. But on the other hand, let's be sane. We have hopefully reached a peak, but let's not throw away everything that we've gained in one fell swoop. So what I think is going to happen is we're going to see not a light switch where, oh, everybody's back to normal. See you at the office tomorrow. We're going to see a gradual reintroduction, which is the way it should be. You should have, uh, let's say, schools opening up in sequence. People should still wear face masks initially to see if we can contain this and not have it re-explode. Sporting events maybe should be delayed if they're, and have people not gathering maybe more than 50 people. So start to do it in steps. Uh, this is going to be new for us. But we, we had to change our life after 9-11. We never had to wait in line at the airport while everybody scanned your baggage. This is just going to be a nuisance for a while. And fine, a nuisance is okay. But let's be careful of our freedoms. One of the things that you brought up in there was the, the physical health and the mental health drain on a lot of people. I mean, we were talking on the phone last night about a, a breast cancer patient who didn't come in for treatment. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, the um, only surgeries we're doing right now are emergency surgeries. Urgent, which is sort of one step down, is uh, not being allowed done right now because A, we don't have enough protective gear. B, the, we don't have the manpower to be doing it right now if you're having all of the hospital geared toward a COVID response. You're not going to have it able to have these hospitalized patients for other reasons. So uh, breast cancer can be, I was talking to an oncologist uh, colleague of mine, and he says he's treating it medically, uh, new breast cancer, rather than having a lumpectomy right now, because it's just not allowed. So one of the, the side effects of this is that we're going to have slightly delayed treatments in a lot of people. So would you recommend for a lot of people right now who are, you know, maybe in that camp of not ER, but urgent care that they need, that they should be coming in now and shouldn't be so scared of getting the coronavirus in the hospital? Because I feel like a lot of people are just scared of coming to the hospital with, you know, a broken hip or something, and they're scared that they're going to get the virus, and really they should be coming into the hospital. Well, those people are, are purposely being told that it's not that they don't want to come in and have it done. Let's say that someone with a breast cancer, they would, I would think that they would want to have it done. It's they're told not to. But you are absolutely correct. I have several patients who I said, well, you're going to have, you know, if you're having chest pains, and I think it's, a, it's your heart, you're going to have to be evaluated. I can do some of it here. If someone has palpitations, I can do an EKG. And I, but I even have patients not wanting to come into my office. And uh, it's something that you have to weigh the risks and the benefits. But that's what life is. When you go to a Laker game or any basketball game, you drive through a lot of traffic. You might get killed, but you weigh the risks and the benefits, and yeah, I'm probably going to make it 99.9% .9 chance, and there's a point where I'm going to go for it. And that's true with everything, but people are so geared up and hyped up for fear, totally out of proportion, because we've talked about mortality. The out of proportion to what the disease is, and this is not to tell you that it can't get serious, and this is not to put down the people who have had loved ones very ill and dying, but we need to put things in perspective. 
30,000 Americans die every year just in a car accident, not including those gravely injured. We have flu seasons where 80,000 people die. We have so many people dying of various diseases before their time that we just need to, we, maybe this will allow us to realign our priorities. At Prager, you were really invested in finding out the truth, especially the truth about all this with so many different opinions. What would you say, if you had to, to summarize everything, is the truth of this situation about what we should be doing? I think it's what you said before. Everybody is fearful. Everybody's terrified. It's the unknown that is fearful. It's the unknown and the uncertainty which is terrifying. Realize that we live in a time, and luckily, particularly in this country, we live in a place that has more of a chance of handling this than anywhere else on earth. We are blessed. And the things that are happening in just a few days, like we talked about with gene sequencing, with vaccination, with new drugs, with research, happening in a flash, in a flash of an eye, it's, it's so quickly, should be so uplifting to people they should be hopeful because we are seeing the end. The end is in sight and we are going to, to conquer this. Sure, it might take time, but we'll move on and some other crisis will erupt and people will put it behind us because for sure as the day follows night, something else will happen and we'll have to deal with that. So be, be malleable, be able to, to flow with the, with the times. You will do well, you will survive, things will get better. People will still have children and people will die. And that's just part of life cycle. And I don't want to be melodramatic, but be hopeful because it's happening. Things are happening so well, much beyond my expectations. Yeah, there is amazing, amazing news out there. Doctors and people across America are working on these things day and night, making sure that we are all safe, getting vaccines, getting ventilators, everything that we might need. And we really appreciate you, oh, my pleasure. everything that you do. And that's about it. We weren't supposed Thank to you. shake hands, I don't think, though. That's okay. We can do this. Okay. I can put problem. on my ear. Okay, let's okay, do that. There we go. There nice. we go. That's much better. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Honestly, this whole experience was incredibly eye-opening for me. We here at PragerU are invested in getting the truth out there. If you like this video, make sure you share with your friends, comment your thoughts down below. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for watching this video. PragerU is a 501c3 organization. Help us keep our videos free by making a tax-deductible donation today. I'd really appreciate your support.